is often remembered as a decade of excess, an era when Reaganomics reigned and hippies became yuppies. We wore parachute pants, moosed our hair, and for most of the decade listened to vinyl. From synth pop to metal, punk to hip hop, the music got us break dancing, head banging, and moonwalking. Hi, I'm Shannon Doherty, and in this five part series, we will look beneath the surface of a period that sometimes seems so superficial. We start with the music video, a concept that forever revolutionized the way that we hear and see music. As America headed into the 1980s, two decades of social and political upheaval had left the nation rattled and the economy weakened. The hostage crisis had shaken American confidence, and many looked for a new kind of leader to steer the country into the new decade. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. With a former B-movie actor at the helm, America entered a new era of prosperity. The soul-searching of the 60s and 70s was over, and the nation was ready to enjoy itself. I want a new drug. There were plenty of new toys to play with. VCRs and video games had Americans spending more time at home. And soon, something called cable TV would make it even harder to leave the living room. When Reagan deregulated the airwaves, a group of brash upstarts launched new media ventures that brought more information to more people than ever before. One idea was a marriage between music and television. The entertainment industry had long been facing new challenges, both in the home and at the malls. Meanwhile, FM radio was an endless blur of inoffensive pop music. This new idea for a channel devoted to something called music videos would end up revitalizing, and often scandalizing, an industry that had no choice but to embrace the fact that music in the 1980s had to have a face. The music video changed the way we look at music and it changed the way we look at the world. It was a new medium perfectly suited to a new generation. And the story begins in 1980. In 1980, 1980 if memory serves me correctly, Twisted Sister was struggling. I was in the studio. I had a day job. I was working at a haagen -Dazs. Putting up outdoor blinds. I was a sophomore at Darien High School. I was almost famous. Pop music entered the 1980s with an uncertain future. Rock audiences were fragmented, and record sales were declining across the nation. While punk rock had made big noise across the Atlantic, it hadn't made a commercial breakthrough in the States. The disco craze was running out of gas, and so was much of America. The hip-hop phenomenon was still years away, and FM radio had gone corporate. Meanwhile, the record-buying public watched, waited, and held on to its cash. One of the biggest stars of the new decade was Christopher Cross. When he won a record-setting five Grammys in 1981, it was an indication of the style of music dominating American Top 40 radio. Inoffensive pop performed by artists short on visual flair. By 1980, I thought pop radio was just a bunch of crap. The best music all summer long. Consultants were brought in to revive the sagging Top 40 radio industry and the results were immediately audible in their programming. More music. What had replaced the intuitive, edgy, idiosyncratic DJs were a lot of uh, consultants who, who used research to find out what the mass audience wanted. From a who... Keep a strong logo, keep the cut short and to the point, and use a younger rock vocal group. It does the job, and it sounds like FM. It literally went into detail about how the guitar sound that Eddie Van Halen has is the FM stereo guitar sound you will find has the best effect on your radio station. It broke it down into categories. If you want people to buy Mercedes, you would play these white bread rock groups that play power, pop, or whatever. And then if you want people who borrow other people's cars, you play the B-52s. I hate even to try and remember the horrible groups that there were around. I remember looking at the charts and feeling sick. Although savaged by critics, these so-called corporate rock bands were immensely popular during the early 80s and dominated the radio dial. I don't care what anybody says about it ever. Sure, it was big and bombastic. It had emotion and had melody and also had flamboyant guitars. I mean, you know, it had it all. Desperate to hold on to their audiences, radio played music that was safe and unobjectionable for fear of alienating listeners. There were few mainstream outlets for new music, and there was a generation of bands waiting to make their mark. The problem that America has to overcome in many ways is that there's no room for 
introduction to new material, really. You only hear established groups on the radio. There's a lot more groups like you two that would really do very, very well here. Now there seems to be a situation where if, if there's even a hint of aggression, and we're an aggressive band, the radio people sometimes become frightened of it. The music industry just couldn't get a break. Pop music even had a new rival for the attention spans and allowances of kids all across the country, video games. I remember it playing Space Invaders for like six hours straight, to the point where I'd go to sleep and I'd close my eyes and see the chick, 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 you know, Yeah, I was obsessed. At the same time, home entertainment was taking on whole new meanings. It will change the way you view television. The VCR was joining the television and the stereo in American living rooms, and so was the cable box. As cable television brought upwards of 50 channels into the home, it introduced a variety of new programming. There was this new idea that you were going to have specialized TV networks. And the idea was that you would be able to pick and choose a little music here, I, I could watch the news, I could get some sports. That was very controversial. To provide for this expanding audience, cable systems scrambled for programming. One group of young pioneers came up with an idea involving music videos. Is this the real life? Visual interpretations of music were not a new concept. Here we've got an abridged version of the number one from Queen. Music videos had been around for years on TV shows like American Bandstand and the UK's Top of the Pops. I had seen music videos in Europe and uh, to take the power of TV and the power of uh, music and sort of put them together in a new way it seemed to be an irresistible combination. The new concept was a cable channel solely dedicated to music videos. It was going to be 24 hours a day showing videos. Seemed like a crazy idea, but I liked it. Everyone said it'll never work. Nobody will ever watch videos. You know, you can just forget it. On August 1st, 1981, Americans tuned into MTV for the first time. Ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll. I'm Mark Goodman. I'm Martha Quinn. I'm J.J. Jackson. I'm Alan Hunter. And I'm Nina Blackwood. On MTV Music Television, you'll never look at music the same way again. The week before the launch of MTV, Air Supply, Kenny Rogers, The Oak Ridge Boys, and Farner all had songs in the top 40. Within two years, popular music would sound and look entirely different. Prince, Madonna, Billy Idol, it looked as if the, we'd all been created for, <laughs> for MTV, but it was just purely by accident. Before the dawn of the video age, we usually heard a band before we saw them. And when we got a good look at them, it was usually on an album cover or a photo in Rolling Stone. But all that changed in the early 80s, when rock stars became TV stars of a fledgling cable channel that got us to look before we listened. A lot of people have said this, but I really think it's the future. It's what FM was years ago, in the sense that it would break new things and new images. In August 1981, MTV was launched in 800,000 American homes. But there was one small problem. We were lying to people, telling we had all these videos. There was like 130 videos, and like 36 of them were Rod Stewart. Played a lot of Rod Stewart. Despite the lack of videos, music fans all over the country couldn't get enough of MTV. Because the medium was so new, there were no standards for video production. Early videos were crude, often rough creations. It's like a frontier, and nobody yet knows what they're even doing here. And that's the joy of it, really. Usually anything that had absolutely no reason to be there was used. We did it. Everybody has done it. <laughs> you know, the, the, the blowing of the wind. Slow motion water. The sand. Birds, the fans. Flowing material. The aeroplane. A horse wandering through the fog for no reason whatsoever. Those early ones with that video glare burning the screen because they're shooting it on videotape. I mean, there's a certain crudeness and sort of colorfulness to shoot it on video as opposed to film. Some of those early videos, you look at them now, it looks so prehistoric. But not everyone was watching music videos. Cable television was first introduced in smaller markets, while cities like New York and Los Angeles were in the dark. In the beginning, the big city-based record labels were blind to the impact of music video. So were some artists. I don't think it's going to revolutionize 
the music industry per se. I think there'll always be going to be big records with little holes and little records with big holes. But everyone paid attention when record sales began reflecting the potential power of the new medium. One night I get a phone call. Going, God, we got great news. The record stores are selling the Buggles albums. They were selling albums that were not being played on the radio. Before long, the top 40 was flooded with high visibility video artists who quickly superseded the interchangeable superstars of the late 70s and early 80s. Thank God for MTV. It's brought a new level of energy to, uh, to the charts. The chart that I saw in 1980 by 1982 was completely different. It was fantastic. If there had been videos for Air Supply and Christopher Cross, they would have probably played them. But they didn't exist, so they had to look to the newer music. Before MTV, British bands had been largely absent from the American charts. But because they had made videos for UK TV shows, British and European bands were poised to swiftly capitalize on music television. The bands that actually had videos ready seemed to be these British haircut bands with one great song. Your Dexys Midnight Runners, your Hazy Vantazy, your Kajagoogoos. They're visual bands, and they're, they're fun to watch. I think I was one of the first beneficiaries of the MTV situation with, with the Cars video. Safety Dance by Men Without Hats. That was the video that defined it all. I mean, to be honest, I like 99 Love Balloons. I used to love that song. I liked the video and the whole night. Bands that had once been snubbed by radio could now fight back on a new battleground and found themselves selling records on the strength of their videos. America is very, very slow in catching up, and the fact that videos do sell records. Videos compress the introduction process between bands and prospective fans. And like many first impressions, looks, attitude, and a sense of humor were important. Aussie rockers men at work realized this, and viewers quickly connected with their quirky videos. The personality of the band came out uh, not through expensive film clips, but just through um, simple ideas. And I think that that's what people responded to. Men at Work's irreverent videos helped drive their singles Who Can It Be Now and Down Under to number one and the band became the best-selling act of 1982. But it was an English band that made the biggest splash in the new medium. I adore Duran Duran. Even to this day, I just think that they're remarkable. With their good looks and catchy pop songs, Duran Duran were a band ready-made for the video era. The band's videos, shot on film and set in exotic locales, quickly gained popularity in the U.S. I remember when Duran Duran came out and changed the whole way that we watch videos, and all of a sudden there were these big cinematic travelogue type productions. It looked like Lawrence of Arabia. In touch with the ground, I'm on the heart of after you. It really made your international success on the basis of videos, isn't that correct? Uh, I think videos have certainly worked to our advantage. I guess it's helpful. <laughs> A lot of people who were sort of scared of what Duran Duran was. It was sort of, you know, out with the old guard. This is this is the way uh, the future is going to look. Hi there. I'm a very normal person, and my name's Boy George. With loads of eyeliner, streaked hair, and a decidedly offbeat fashion sense, the new video stars played fast and loose with issues of gender and sexuality. People haven't seen things like us before. You know, we were the new breed of, of freaks for people to dine on. Is it a guy or is it a girl? They call me a like, offspring of a gay Rastafarian pastry chef. Culture Club's Boy George kept viewers guessing with his androgynous persona, and he wasn't bashful about it. Androgynous is a trendy word, and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really want to hurt me? There were kids living in the outback, you know, living in these small cities that were gay or odd or, or, or felt disenfranchised, and suddenly, you know, MTV was bringing all these freaks into their hometown. Like, oh my god, that guy's wearing so much makeup, what a freak. But then you get used to him, and the songs are good, and all of a sudden it does, it becomes acceptable. Perhaps the biggest surprise from this young Englishman in a dress with the eyeshadow and lipstick 
is his broad appeal to middle America. He's made Culture Club's music popular with all ages, from grade schoolers to senior citizens. While Boy George tested the limits of masculinity, Annie Lennox from the Eurythmics experimented with bending gender the other way. Annie Lennox was kind of like the female version of myself. It was like, you know, the sort of female androgynous character of the time. I find the video medium rather bland, and Dave and I are trying to, to produce something that, is, that doesn't have those qualities. It was often easy to miss how great a singer Annie Lennox was because of a lot of you know, her fascination with imagery. But she's become an important force because of her voice. As the video age entered adolescence, the verdict seemed to be that while fans might be drawn in by a band's video, they were just as likely to move on unless the music was good. Video television froze out some 70s acts that couldn't adapt to the new medium, and it also created its own clique of stars. But there were growing pains ahead. Next. We saw the crowning of the first black Miss America and the first black astronaut launched into space. But when we looked for black artists in the new frontier of music television, there was a void. That is, until a pop superstar smashed through its largely homogenous playlist. It occurred to me, having watched MTV over the last few months, um, that it's, 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 got, it's a solid enterprise with it and it's got a lot going for it. I'm just floored by the fact that there's so many, so few black artists featured on it. Why is that? MTV was taking a slam, and, they were, and I was even taking a bit of a slam for being on it. And it was, excuse me, but both. Do you have a chance to watch MTV from time to time? Yeah, there's nothing to watch. When they put some black people on there, you know, I'll watch it. The criteria was you had to be thought of as a rock artist. And if you happen to be black, yellow, green, or yellow, they didn't care as long as that was, that was the criteria there. In 1983, Rick James led a public assault on MTV for not playing black artists. Where was Rick James, Super Freak? Where was Diana Ross? Where was Earth, Wind, and Fire? Where was Stevie Wonder? I mean, the fact of the matter was, in the early days, MTV was sort of a rock and roll channel. There weren't a lot of African-American rock artists. But MTV's all-rock format shattered, and its color barrier broke when the incomparable Michael Jackson released his new videos. Videos were an ideal showcase for Jackson, who had grown up in the song and dance Motown scene. That's the background that he came from, you know, having to do those kind of shows, and since he was a child, doing very tight choreography stuff with his brothers. Michael Jackson is such a great performer. He was able to take these routines and then put it in the context of a video. He could dance. Michael Jackson could dance, that's why he was able to use video. All he had to do was have the camera on. But in 1984, Michael Jackson introduced audiences to 14 minutes that was unlike anything they'd ever seen. His video for Thriller. The video, directed by John Landis, was the most expensive of its time. So I said to Michael, listen, Michael, I'd love to make something more elaborate, which Michael picked up on, because that's what he wanted to do. His whole thing was, we got to be good, it's got to be great, it's got to be big. The best. The best. Thriller was the video that everyone was glued to their TV sets to see. It really was like the equivalent of a film opening today, you know, where people are like, did you see it, did you see it, did you go? It was definitely the music biz before Thriller and the music biz after Thriller. Thriller just took video making to a whole other level. These videos were like these swirling statements of his incredible talent as a performer. Thanks largely to Michael Jackson's event videos, Thriller became the biggest album of the decade and eventually sold over 40 million copies worldwide. Other artists had videos, other artists had records, but other artists weren't Michael Jackson. Michael sort of artistically raised the bar for everybody. Think about this, after that, you know, you see Pat Benatar, if you like that dancing. Going, we are we are young. Oh Lord, now we have to dance too. Heartache to heartache, All of a sudden, everybody is Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers now. No, I'm not the Fred Astaire, but I could be. In my mind, I think I am. Lionel dances about as good as me. I think I can outdance you, Lionel. By the time of Thriller's breakout success, the music industry had woken up. People were buying records again. Walkmans and CDs were lending music a high-tech air. Music was back, 
and much of the credit belonged to the promotional and artistic medium of music video. But not everyone was singing the praises of the new medium. It pissed off a lot of people who were just purely musicians. Uh, you're faking songs. Yeah. I think that's hard. All they can do is just kind of lip sync uh, a song and pretend to play their instruments. And, you know, I think that's yeah. Some musicians and some people who can make great records and maybe not particularly visually minded might get blown out. You know, so a good record could be killed by a bad video. You know, you talk video killed the radio store. I remember bands like Joe Jackson and Supertramp. When people saw what they looked like, it was over. I'm in the business of making music. I'm not an actor, and I'm not a dancer, and I'm not uh, trying to sell my face. The thing I'd like to say about videos is that I, I sort of resent the fact that a kid grows up, dreams about playing the guitar, and all of a sudden has to be an actor. To me, that makes absolutely no sense at all. Yeah, but, but listen, when you perform on stage, you're acting. I mean, that's a performance, so what's... I mean, if someone puts a camera on you, what's the difference? A big criticism of video was that it destroyed the individual's response to the song. People said, well, you're spelling out the song in the video. I, I, I don't see that, actually. I think the sad thing is when you do a video for a song, it really pins it down, nails it all down, which I think is sad because the music should inspire your imagination somewhat. People have been very critical about it, you know, and, oh, video spoiled this and video spoiled that, but there was a lot of fun to be had in those videos. I wasn't keen on making videos. I mean, it wasn't something I really wanted to do. When I did the video, I was so pissed off <laughs> that I'm, gra I'm grabbing my fist and I'm attacking air because I'm so angry about having to do this. The stars who most resented getting in front of the camera were those who'd found fame before it was necessary for musicians to make videos. It took a long time for a lot of the major artists to feel like they needed to make videos. I always said, I'm not doing a video. You know, flat. Just not doing one. You got to hide it, hide it, hide. As a writer of tunes, as a guy who puts words together. You want people to use their own imagination. Everybody tried making a video, and there were definitely lots of times where you saw an artist on MTV, and they were smiling and lip syncing, and you could just sense, right out of camera range, there was a rifle trained on them, making sure they did it. I'm still standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the record companies force you to do them. They say you have to do them. I hate doing them. Um, when I say I hate doing them, I hate having to do anything. I had a tough time doing it. I really did because it's... I deal in audio, and to me, audio should do it all. But then I'm watching these video clips. A lot of the new groups are really doing it well. They really got it. It's exciting. I mean, there were some dissenters even at that point. The way I do that, you know, what, make videos and, you know... But it quickly became, if you didn't, you're going to get left behind. The boat is leaving. Well, in the high school lunchroom, you know, if you like Duran Duran and, and Culture Club, you're arguing with guys sitting across the table saying, hey, the boss would never sink that low. Well, guess what? The boss sank that low, and he wasn't as good at it as Duran Duran or Culture Club. Like many established artists, Bruce Springsteen initially resisted making a video, and in fact, didn't even appear in his first one. What do you think the relationship between music and video should be for you? It's like a tool, it's a powerful tool. You know, but how I'm going to address it or what I, what I feel I'm going to do with it. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. But when he attempted to reach a larger audience, he cleaned up his look, hired director Brian De Palma, and to the amazement of his fans, even danced on TV. The artists of the 60s and 70s who managed to attract new fans in the 80s were the ones who weren't afraid of video. A good video is a good song, and that's the bottom line. I, I still think of myself as a songwriter and a singer first. I have only recently begun, begun to become comfortable in front of a camera. I guess more people are, are adjusting to it these days because it's sort of automatic now. You make a record, you make a video. But in, in the old days, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was awkward for a lot of us. There was artists like Peter Gabriel, although he was a singer-songwriter, turned out to embrace video to such a great degree that he really pushed the entire genre forward. It was gratifying to see, for an MTV fan, these established artists trying to cross over to us rather than waiting to cross over to them. 
Music video originated as an innovative medium for young visual artists and up-and-coming bands. But as the 80s progressed, everyone had gotten in on the act. Video had become the hippest form of artistic expression and an essential way to reach an audience. When we come back... In the 60s and 70s, women raised their voices, took to the streets, and demanded equality. By the 80s, we had a woman on the Supreme Court and another who vowed to take over the world. Women were now empowered, politically and musically. We'd go to radio stations and, and programmers, you know, would say, well, you know, we've only got really one slot that we can play a female. We're playing, you know, the pretenders right now. The charts are male-dominated until sort of the 80s, and then they became increasingly female-dominated. It was part of the 60s women's rights thing finally coming to fruition. Plus, video made women real fun to look at. The first female video star, and by far the most successful, was Madonna. Madonna is an artist born of the video age. There are better singers than Madonna, there are better dancers than Madonna, but Madonna is a star. In a way, Madonna was kind of a, a Dylan of the 80s, that she came out of the sticks, went to New York, came up with her own sound, her own identity, took the world by storm. What are your dreams? What's left? Mm, to rule the world. <laughs> there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Madonna. Music video became an essential part of Madonna's strategy for world domination. Video generally brought music to the level of advertising, and I think that Madonna is definitely an executive in the world of advertising. I'll repeat it again and, um, and annoy everyone who was annoyed before when I said it. I want to conquer the world. While many women in music videos were often relegated to being sex objects, Madonna shrewdly used her ever-changing but always provocative persona to her advantage. I'm a very sexual person, and that comes through in my performing. And if that's what gets people to buy my records, then that's fine. She used the medium and didn't allow the medium to use her as much. She, she was conscious of that. And, and reinvented herself several times. She has consistently found ways to adjust, update, alter, transfer her image through her videos to keep herself interesting and to keep herself new. I remember being a junior in high school and the entire sophomore class looked like Madonna in that Lucky Star video. The entire sophomore class. When you wear Madonna clothes, everybody looks at you, right? Everybody just, everybody yeah, stares yeah, and says, like, look at that girl over yeah. there. And she's like our idol, you know? It's the only one that we can look up to nowadays. When I really realized the power of a video was with my Material Girl video. That seemed to have such a huge impact on people. It would seem to be as important as the actual song. I think the fact that Madonna is so sophisticated at a video level does not take away from what the music is. I don't think you can sustain that sort of career ultimately if the music isn't there. I don't think anyone apart from the Beatles and the Rolling Stones have created so many iconic pieces of pop music. Music video allowed female artists to be creative and to experiment with their images. While Madonna used sex as a big part of her image, Cindy Lauper found success by playing up her quirkiness. Lauper became an inspiration for young women with her nonconformist looks and her feminist anthems. I saw it as a feminist movement, not just a song. When I saw three generations of women, grandmothers with their rhinestones, mothers with their hair pushed back and spray painted on one side, and little girls, to see that, it really made me feel like I did something. Cindy's videos did more than influence fashion. They also helped sell more than five million copies of her album, She's So Unusual. Cindy Lauper seemed to embody all of the kind of crazy energy that MTV was cutting loose. You know, she just got that. She just captured it. She just rode that energy. Whoa. 
As a bright, happy aesthetic became fashionable in music videos, some female artists felt they had little choice but to play along. As far as the image of us being clean and wholesome, I, I think that that was really something foisted upon us. The idea of being what we really were, which was guzzling, foul-mouthed girls, I don't think people wanted that. It was like, well, if that's going to help sell records, whatever. Many women artists found they were judged on their looks much more harshly than male artists. I really wanted to look the way that I wanted to look, which was good, um, but not be not taken seriously because I looked good. There was one English director who uh, said, well, darling, you've got the ass and Anne's got the face, so we'll just shoot your body and we'll shoot Anne's face. It was the 80s. It was the way people fought. Image was everything. The dogma of image ruled the 80s, but some female artists were determined to be who they wanted to be. Forced to define themselves visually, female artists came up with a lexicon of styles that's still pervasive today. The sex kitten, the girl next door, the hard rock chick, and the teen pop goddess. But while many female artists found success on video, some have continued to thrive as musicians and businesswomen, proving themselves much more than just pretty faces. Be it changed. Music video dramatically altered our conceptions of what made a pop star. Nine years after Christopher Cross swept the Grammys with his airy ballads, Millie Vanilli won the award for Best New Artist. But when the duo was exposed for not really singing... So we give this Grammy back now? Their story was taken as a cautionary tale. Talent had to count as much as image. But others point out that style has been essential to rock since Elvis Presley and credit the video with reinvigorating pop music. There's always been such a strong aesthetic component to contemporary music that I don't understand why people complain about the advent of the music video. Critics complain that video created instant stars whose looks outclassed their talent. And, they argued, the music of the 80s would never last. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me. I was told that the music that we were doing was called disposable art. Well, my music is not disposable. There were a lot of old guard people saying, you know, it's style over substance. That obviously hasn't been the case. I mean, a lot of that music is still very classic. I think there are a lot of people who wouldn't think we would still be here talking about Duran Duran 15 years later. I remember a Rush review in the Village Voice in 1985 that, you know, mentioned Madonna and said, what will she be doing too, if not five years from now? Well, five years after 1985, it was Rush that nobody had ever heard of. It was easy to say, this is just candy. Kids like it now, and they're going to forget it next week. The reality is, the memorable videos did make an emotional connection with people. Music videos completely changed the way that people engaged with music and understood the world around them. Despite some ups and downs, it seems clear that the new medium rewarded raw talent as much as it helped elevate pretenders to the pop throne. It changed the way bands and their fans interacted and brought musicians to more faces in more places than ever before. Whether video killed the radio star or not is still open to debate. But video definitely helped make stars out of innovative 80s artists like Duran Duran, Michael Jackson, and Madonna. And it was their vision and creativity that gave birth to a revolution that continues to inspire today's artists. In the next hour, we will look at 1980s heavy metal. I'm Shannon Doherty, and I'll see you then.